Hello, everyone, and welcome to this session called Lost Women of Science Found. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Juliana Lemire, science writer at Gen, and I'll be your host. Here at RFS, as you've likely heard in other sessions, we like to highlight and discuss issues impacting women in science. Typically, we focus on issues that affect women working in STEM today, but this session will be a little different. We'll spend the next 45 minutes focusing on women scientists from the past. The question we'll raise is, how many of their stories are known to us? The answer is, not enough. There are likely many different reasons for that, but the bottom line is that their stories have not been told. But a group of motivated people are trying to change that. Today, we're joined by two of them, Katie Hafner and Amy Scharf, to tell us how they plan to do it. Katie Hafner is a longtime reporter for the New York Times, where she continues to be a frequent contributor. She also is the author of six works of nonfiction, and her first novel, The Boys, was just published this past July. She's also the host and executive producer of Our Mothers Ourselves, an interview podcast that celebrates extraordinary mothers. Amy Scharf is a bioethicist at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. She is the immediate past chair of the Board of Trustees of Children's Aid, a nonprofit that provides comprehensive social, educational, and health services to children in New York City's underserved communities. We're thrilled to have you with us today, Amy. Thank you so much, Juliana. It's great to be here. Katie and Amy will tell us about the Lost Women of Science Initiative, a nonprofit educational organization with the overarching goal of inspiring girls and young women to embark on careers in STEM. Because as the Lost Women of Science Initiative says on its website, for every Rosalind Franklin or Katherine Johnson whose story has been told, there are dozens more whose stories remain unknown to the public at large or even to contemporaries in their field. Katie and Amy and their team believe it is imperative to tell the stories of women who've shifted our understanding of the world around us but have been lost to history. So to learn more about all of this, let me start by asking both of you, how did you two come together to work on this project? And did you know each other previously? You wanna take that, Amy? Sure, so Katie and I first met, we were, um, I was living in San Francisco and Katie and I met through a mutual friend um, and we became close and fast friends. And we always talked about our interest in, in writing and in science um, and storytelling. And I, came to her with this story that I heard through a friend of mine, for um, those of you who maybe have listened to the first season of our podcast on Dr. Dorothy Anderson. I heard the story of Dr. Anderson from the mother of a good friend of mine, heard all about her, what an incredible person she was, a great mentor. Oh, and by the way, she happened to isolate and name the disease cystic fibrosis in the 1930s, which had theretofore been um, unknown. And I told Katie this story. And I said, this is an incredible story. We have to tell this story. How should we do it? And we really um, talked about it for years, a, a book a series of articles, how should we tell this story? And then we came, well, Katie came to me with the idea of telling it through a podcast, which I thought was great, and then said, well, why should we stop there? For every Dorothy Anderson, there must be thousands of Dorothys who made these incredible contributions, breakthroughs, discoveries, but we don't know their names. And if we don't know their names, well, I'll bet a lot of people don't know their names. So why don't we embark on a project to tell these stories? And here we are. This is correct. <laughs> it's exactly how it happened. Um, and Amy is such a good sport. I mean, I tend to be, uh, of the two of us, we're very yin and yang, and I tend to be the bright, shiny object person, and Amy is the very rational partner. And so when I said, let's do an entire series, a whole podcast series, and call it Lost Women of Science, and she's like, okay. <laughs> and we, unbelievably enough, it took off. First, we got a really generous grant. We've gotten a, some wonderful uh, funding support um, from Eric Schmidt's uh, Schmidt Futures, from the John Templeton Foundation. Um, but our big Kickstarter grant, it wasn't technically a Kickstarter project, but a big, big, wonderful gift of a grant was um, from the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. And um, that got us through 
what, Amy, the first... Um, Almost a little over the first year. Yeah. And then we just got a wonderful grant from the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. And that's going to see us through 2023? Oh, 2023. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So um, we can... I, I, what amazes me is, and I'm not sure why I'm surprised, is that these foundations and, you know, every single funder we've talked to has been a man, by the way. It, it, they've been incredibly supportive. Like they see the value in telling these stories and telling them in a rich way, in a way that ter, uh, turns these women into, you know, 360 degree humans. Um, who, not just her science, but her life and the context in which she lived and um, everything she had to put up with which was a lot. Right. And, and at the same time, not to, to underplay the science, it's really imperative that not only do we tell the stories of the women and the contexts in which they lived and worked, but also what, what was the science behind their work? Um, for example, in the first season, when we talk about Dorothy Anderson and cystic fibrosis, we spend really quite a bit of time talking about the science of cystic fibrosis and the advances that are happening today and where, where those could be taking us. Yeah, it is so important to balance everything that you were just talking about, the science, but also the context, right? Both are just so fundamentally important to the storytelling. Right. So and that's a, that's a big of our, it's a big reason. It's a, it's a big raison d'etre for us. Um, we are, we're published by, uh, by in partnership with um, Scientific American. And we've gone back and forth a lot with um, our wonderful, I call him our boss at Scientific American, Jeff Del Vizio, who um, we've talked a lot about how deep into the science do we should we get at Lost Women of Science. And he says very strongly and clearly, let's do deep dives. How, you know, and make it, we, we make it accessible but we do a deep dive. We don't gloss over this, the science itself because these women were working on really, really complicated things. Cystic fibrosis pathophysiologically is a very complex disease and she uh, puzzled her way through it by doing autopsies many uh, and studying many, many pathology reports from previous autopsies all over the world. Yeah, let me stick with that for a second because I'm really curious as to how you kind of decide on the women that you're going to tell their stories. But before we go to that, I mean, now in the three seasons, you have her, as you said, Dorothy Anderson, um, a mechanical engineer, a computer scientist. I mean, how do you, you know, tell those, like, learn about the, that science? I mean, that's a lot. Those are very varied <laughs> fields and then tell all of that science like how does what does that process look like well uh it's, so you're asking a couple of kind of a multi-fold question um so how we decide um we have this database which um is kind of the the our crown jewel um and it we have I don't know, it's growing and growing. I mean, so I think we're up to about 300 women. We keep adding women to the database and we go through the database to try to figure out who, whose story could sustain an entire multi-episode season. But we keep in mind, um, we don't wanna do, you know, everyone, they have to be different. Not everyone can be a physician or, um, so we go to different fields. We also um, want to make sure that our that the women we profile that it's a, a diverse collection of women, and then we see what might be out there about this woman, and that's a huge commitment. You know, it's a six month. We're trying to get, shave it down to like more like four. Um, let's call it now, since this is our new goal, a four month process of putting together um, an entire season. But the other thing we're doing in order to, because if we go, keep going at this rate, you know, not only will I be long dead, you know, but um, we'll just never get through them. And so, um, so we're starting something called Lost Women of Science Shorts, where we, um, we do kind of, it's almost a, a miniature version of a season 
and we tell one woman's story in about 30 minutes, 30 minutes or less. And, um, and that's, that's very exciting because now we can cover more women. Um, and then we're doing something in order to bring more women to, into, into, into the light is, um, something we're calling that was Amy's idea um, from our inbox uh, where, cause we, uh, Juliana, we get lots of people writing to us saying, you need to, this woman needs to be somehow featured or known and, and people are very passionate about it. And so what we do is that we go, we go to that person, the person who wrote to us and we do a very short recording with that person and they tell the story. And that's, it's part of what we're hoping will be our crowdsourcing effort. I mean, it, it, uh, my thesis here is there are truly thousands of women completely buried by history, sidelined and then buried. And so what we're hoping to do is start a crowdsourcing project where we send troops in to do archeological digs through um, archives at higher ed institutions and, um, and dig these women out. Does that sound crazy? No, no, that doesn't <laughs> sound crazy at all. Um, I actually, I, I want to get back to the science question, but before we do, this touches on another question that I have, because Amy, you were saying that this whole idea started because basically somebody told you about Dorothy Anderson, right? And so yes. I, yeah, I, I was having the same thought when you were saying that. And then Katie, when you were just speaking, like, I guess I feel like time is of the essence, like, you, do you feel like you have to almost get these stories before they're, I mean, th I know they're lost, but before they're lost forever kind of situation. Oh, absolutely. So um, it, like, if you think about how we started the kind of serendipitous nature of it is really sitting and hearing something at a completely unexpected time, but then kind of highlights the importance of sitting and listening and being present um, and writing things down. Um, and it is a really big concern that some of the women might get lost. In fact, one of the reasons, one of the, the impetus for embarking on the shorts is there are um, some women in our database who are incredibly compelling, but because of when they lived and how they died and what they did, the, um, the research is unfortunately really just not plentiful enough to, to devote mm -hmm. hours and hours to, um, of a podcast. We can really, we can do, we can tell her story, but unfortunately we can only tell her story in 30 minutes because that's the amount of um, information we have. Uh, there's, for example, like one scientist who worked, um, at Oak Ridge, Tennessee on the, on the Manhattan project and then died in her, he was at mid thirties or mid forties of cancer. And because she died so young and because she worked on such classified information, it's really hard to get that uh, enough data resources to tell her story, but we really do want to at least highlight her if only for 30 minutes. Let's return to the science just for one second, because it is so important. So how, I mean, do you bring in scientific advisors? How do you decide how you're going to tell the scientific part of that story? Oh, absolutely. The, the scientific advisors are a really important part of each of our seasons. We have really two things to like, we've taken two tracks on that. The first is to try to bring on for a season, what we're calling like a, our science advisor, um, someone who uh, is familiar with the field and can explain it to us and explain it to our listeners. Um, our first season, it was uh, Jane Grogan and she worked with us on uh, telling the story of Dorothy Anderson. We also have brought in um, content experts, people who are in either academia or other fields who have written extensively on the specific fields. Um, for example, season two, when we told the story of Clara Don von Neumann, we brought in um, Tom Hay, who is a professor at University of Wisconsin, correct, Katie? Correct, yeah. At, and um, he is really one of the foremost experts in the world on early computer history and Clara von Neumann herself. So you're three seasons in now, and I'm wondering, 
who are, who's listening to the podcast? Do you have a sense of, is it young women? Is it a huge swath of different people, people in science, people outside of science? Or is it hard to know? <laughs> that is such a good question. We wish we we wish we could drill deeper into the into the demographics of our listenership. We know that people all over this country and all over the world listen to it. From some of the emails we get from people, my sense, Amy, let me know if you think if you agree. My sense is that it's mostly people familiar with science. We want to. We're trying. To to think, start thinking about um, working our way into curricula um, so that the podcast gets integrated into, into science curricula. Um, I think I would say middle school and up, you know, and if the science goes over their head, just push the 30, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you don't have the patience for that, but whatever they can absorb uh, would, would be great. Right. The same thing. I just echo what Katie said. And unfortunately, we don't have the numbers. We do know that we've had to date around 415,000 downloads of the podcast. Yeah. And we're very proud and excited about that from the US, but also um, really all over the world from um, the UK, Europe, India, Australia. It's, it's, it's really, it's been really heartening to see the, the widespread diversity of, of downloads at least geographically, and we wish we knew the other demographics. One thing we, I keep kind of coming back to this idea of how much we rely on our listeners to bring the women to us. And uh, one thing that we said in the first season, which I thought was really good was, you know, if you go into your you know, grandmother's basement, and there are all these boxes, don't just throw them away, open the boxes. And one thing I'm doing right now, which is very personal for me, and very uh, emotional is, um, I don't know what got me thinking about this. But my grandmother, her name was Leona Zacharias, she was married to my grandfather, who was a very well known atomic physicist at MIT, and they had met when they were both at, she was at Barnard in the 1920s, uh, and, she, and he was at Columbia doing physics, and she got her PhD from Columbia in 1938 in biology. And I, but I never ever heard a word about her science. So she was working at the same time that Dorothy Anderson was working at Columbia. and. I found this old, and so I just thought, I wonder, I don't know what motivated me to start looking into her, but over the summer, I just Googled her name. All I knew about her was that she was kind of mean. She was, she had a bit of mean streak. She seemed a little bit angry. She was imperious. I was very frightened of her and that's all I know. Uh, and, uh, but I knew her pretty well, but her science never came up. Uh, when I was around. So I started to Google her and oh my gosh, I see that her papers are collected at MIT and at Harvard at the Mass Eye and Ear Infirmary. And I, but I didn't know what it was all about. So I went there and I went through the archives and she was instrumental in something, it turns out, called retrolental fibroplasia, which is, um, it became an epidemic in the 1940s of blindness in premature infants, four pounds and under is what they were studying. And you guys, she did a ton of work in this and all these papers are published and it just, the scales fell from my eyes. I mean, this woman was absolutely brilliant. And then, well, actually, you know what? I'm not gonna tell you because. <laughs> It's a very, I, so I'm in the, so I'm going to do a short on my, the, the bottom line is I'm doing a, sh a 30 minute right. short on my grandmother. And, and it's like this detective story. It's like, as I'm sitting there in the archives, like, what was her role? What was her role? And um, I'm not going to tell you because that's yeah. going to be the surprise. Stay tuned. I can't wait. I know. And this yeah, is that was a great little, teaser. When I say, if your grandmother has boxes in the basement, I'm not kidding. 
Right. And, and in fact, that stems from um, our first season on Dorothy Anderson. When she passed away, she left all of her papers and documents to a friend of hers. And her, I think this friend's grandson had the papers in his basement and there was a flood or a fire, spring cleaning, whatever, and lost, gone. Hmm. To add the, and the only way that MIT, apropos of what Amy just said, the only way that MIT got my grandmother's papers is that she, when she died, her office was left and they were changing buildings and cleaning out her office and found all the files. So my guess is, I don't know this for sure, she did not leave her papers in a formal way to MIT. Um, and then my grandfather, who was has a big, big stack of boxes at MIT of his work, her stuff is, and this is often the case, her stuff is sort of in there with his. Uh, so uh, we've gone through that as well. And actually, actually a phenomenon that is quite common. In fact, our, our, our season two subject, our Don von Neumann, Katie and a bunch of our, our team literally went hunting through the archives at the Library of Congress for John von Neumann, who is very well known and was the husband of Clara. And most of her papers and her work are at the bottom of his boxes or hidden within his boxes. Yeah. Physically and metaphorically, right? I mean, Correct. Yes. Exactly. So this brings up kind of a bigger question, um, and I'm not sure if it's one that the Lost Women of Science is engaging in, but I mean, is there now you're in doing the podcast, you're also gathering all this, you know, information on a database or physically boxes. I mean, is there a plan or, or do you have any, any interest in like archiving all these physical things or, or you know, setting up a, a library or a, a physical place for all of these um, very important materials to, to be kept for history? Funny you should ask. <laughs> Amy, do you want to? <laughs> it's funny you should ask. So that actually has been a priority of ours from day one. I think from Again, to like talk about uh, our podcast and the ep and the seasons, but our our a lot of our information on Dorothy Anderson was literally in our friends was in Celia Ores, who was featured on the podcast her her daughter's basement, um, and you'll actually hear in the podcast of um, them going into the basement and going through boxes. And again, that's how so much of our information is coming, and it became apparent to us very early on that we have to. Save, not only save this information, save them literally from the dustbins of history, but put them somewhere and then make them accessible to um, students, to educators, to scholars, to whoever is interested, whether it be physical, digital, or both. Because what good does it do if the if she's preserved? You know, we have we we're not in total agreement with traditional archivists in that if a if if a woman's papers are somewhere in a box, somewhere in a in an archive at a higher ed institution, how does anyone even know about them? Even finding aids at these archives don't aren't entirely reliable. Right. So, um, right. So we're we're actually in conversations now with with a higher education institution to to form an archive resource center to make, to both house the materials and make them accessible. So I guess another question that I have is what would you say, and I think we've touched on some of them, but are there any goals of the initiative, the Lost Women of Science initiative um, that we haven't touched on yet? Or what would you say are the major goals of the initiative? Well. The overarching goal, as you said in, in your introduction, is to inspire girls and young women to pursue STEM. And we're doing doing it slightly in a backwards way uh, in that we're doing kind of the Ginger Rogers, hey, if she could do it, you know, backwards in high heels, then 
you know, look at what you can do. Look at what you can do. Uh, and so if, so, and also to be inspired, that's why we tell the full story because we want them, uh, them being these girls who are thinking of going into science to somehow, we want to light a fire and we want to light a fire in the, in the form of a story. Um, you know, we, we tell our, it's the Joan Didion line. We tell ourselves stories in order to live and also in order to work, I think, in order to find a passion. I feel exactly the same. And, and I wish there was a way, like a metric <laughs> that we had to say, to show that um, the message is, is being heard and, and people are being inspired. Um, and we'll just, we'll keep telling the stories and, and hopefully keep inspiring. And part of the reason to tell the story of um, a diverse group of scientists from both geographically, racially, religious, age, uh, fields of science is to really appeal to girls and young women from across the board, and especially from uh, populations that are historically underrepresented in, in STEM. You know, to see that if these women who could overcome really extraordinary obstacles could still pursue their passions, and not only pursue their passions but also make incredible contributions to their field, then um, then you can do it as well. And what would you say? since starting out, just embarking on this initiative, what has the, been, say, the biggest surprise or the, the biggest thing that you've learned from, from the beginning until now? You know, I have to say, I've been surprised by just how many women there are. I mean, I had a sense that there were a lot, but I'm now kind of I'm shocked, I'm appalled, I'm angry. Um, one thing I like to say is, you know, at Lost Women of Science, we're not curious. I mean, we're not, wait, what do I say? I say, we're not mad, we're curious. Okay, we're a little mad. So uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's what I have been surprised by. What about you, Amy? I've been surprised by that, but I've also been so wonderfully, pleasantly surprised by um, people who've said, like, this is, what what took you so long? Um, why why aren't these stories being told more often and, and more, more deeply? And the other thing, not that I've been surprised at, but, well, kind of surprised, but another theme that keeps running through is, why are we still having these conversations? Why do we need to like, you know, why does there, <laughs> it gives us a job, but why does there need to be a podcast where we tell stories of, of women who were lost to, to history? That shouldn't be. And um, sometimes the frustration of like, why do we still have to keep mm -hmm. telling these stories and, 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 and unearthing these women? And why didn't they get the recognition? Yeah. And why perhaps are some still not getting the recognition? Yeah, we, we do hope to be put out of business at some point. Um, I mean, I guess that's a good question looking at where we are today, right? Which, to your point, Amy, of course, I mean, sexism is so rampant in the STEM community even now. But at the same time, I can walk into a bookstore and right on the front table is Jennifer Doudna's face on the cover of a book, right? Her story is being, is, is been told, is being told and others as well. It's not just Jennifer Doudna. So I guess my question from that is, you know, do you think that it's changing now? If so, how much and kind of how can we keep making that better? Katie, what do you think as, as the journalist, is, do you feel like it's changing now? Um, I do. In fact, this is really interesting. I don't know if you're familiar with um, the Finkbeiner test. No. So let me just give you a brief little primer on that. So mm -hmm. this science journalist named Anne Finkbeiner uh, decided one day, uh, maybe 10 years ago, uh, that she was so she'd been writing about women and all the obstacles that women had faced. Um, she and she'd been doing profiles of female scientists for years and years and years, and she was so sick and tired and bored 
of writing about all the all the obstacles they had to overcome, um, and then talk about how they were the first of this and the first doing that. And then in these profiles, she they her editor would say, well, what does her husband do? And how does she deal with childcare? And she just said, you know what, I'm done. I, so I am never going to write any of that stuff again. I'm not even going to mention that this woman is a woman. <laughs> and so uh, another science journalist named Christy Ashwanden saw that blog post of, of, Fink, of Ann Finkbeiner's and she said, oh my gosh, we need to start the Finkbeiner test. So now it's every time you write a profile of somebody, you can you know, don't even mention that, you know, she, she needs childcare or, or, or how she overcame this kind of harassment or, uh, or sexism or barrier, or is the first to have done this or that. And um, so you're now they say you can't mention any of that. And we're doing our um, our bonus episode on for season three on the Finkbeiner test, pushing back on the Finkbeiner test a little bit. Like, but these things, I personally think that, especially if you're doing something long, um, that you want a textured, um, a really richly textured look at this woman. But the, what's relevant to your question is that as we were putting together the bonus episode and interviewing Anne Finkbeiner. For it, she said, you know, I've been doing these stories about women in astronomy now. And what they say is that they are just making astronomy female. And we're like, well, what does that mean? And what it means is that, you know, they're saying this is what an astronomer looks like. We wear, you know, great clothes. We we dress in high heels. We have kids and we bring them to work and we worry about it. And 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 it, they're very ag aggressively that way. They, it's like we are changing the pro the profile itself of the mm -hmm. scientist. So, but Juliana, you're a scientist. What do you think? I think it's intriguing. What's that changing the the vision of what a scientist looks like? You mean? Yeah, of what a scientist looks like. Absolutely. I mean, I I remember years ago there was a you know, would they ask kids to kind of draw a scientist? I mean, there was even a paper published on this, I want to say, and, you know, the, the image was bleak, you know, I mean, it was like, it's a, you know, it was Albert Einstein. Uh, yeah, exactly. And, and I mean, yeah, I worked, I, I worked in labs for a long time and that is not what a scientist looks like. So yeah, I think the more, images that get out there, whether it's podcasts, books, magazines, writing, you know, Jen, um, anywhere. And I'm certainly cognizant of, you know, the people that I interview in my own, for my own stories. Um, and I'm always trying to include as diverse voices as I can, but, but, you know, still it remains that the majority of voices tend to still be and awards and and even other metrics like grants and things like that it's still it's, it's getting better but slowly mm -hmm. slowly so amy and katie i'm sure that this has not been easy and a lot of people i'm sure have kind of thought about doing this but haven't actually done it and here you are you're doing it but as I said, I'm sure it hasn't been easy. What have been the challenges and what has motivated you to keep going? Um, well, I'll start and I'll, I'll tell you what I think some of the, the challenges are and Katie can join and then of course, we started this in the fall of 2020. So during COVID and our whole team our whole initiative operates remotely. We have, all of us in our production team have been together in a room once um, in the past two and a half years. And so in many ways, it's very hard to do this work remotely because, um, you know, the creative process really lends itself to actually being together and bouncing ideas across, you know, back and forth. And it's just harder to do that remotely. So that's been a huge challenge. But at the same time, in many ways, it's been great in that we've been able to bring in people to the project from all over the country and even all over the world. I mean, Katie's in San Francisco. I'm in New York. 
We have people, we have a producer in Toronto, we have a producer in Portland, we have a composer in Australia. So we are really able to bring in a wonderful, dedicated group of, of people, but it's not without its challenges operating remotely. Absolutely. And then on the creative side, I uh, constantly chagrined by the dearth of archival material um, that we sometimes are able to put our hands on. It is hugely challenging. Um, for instance, in season three, YY's daughter, Carol Lawson, she co she collected many of the, you know, the, the the signs of her mother's success, the plaques and the and the diplomas and the certificates and the awards. But where is her pro where was her process? You know, where there her her papers, what she wrote in the marginalia of her papers, her correspondence, her professional correspondence, gone. And so a lot of it is reading between the lines, some of it is speculation. And and I just keep coming back to this. We um, we live by the archives that we can that we can unearth, and because we are very devoted to being accurate, we put every single sentence through the fact checking ringer. And if we can't verify something, we're very clear that we it can't be verified. And we do a lot of correcting of the record, like. A lot of what Jess Wade is doing on Wikipedia, we do every single time that we uh, that we do a season. You know, I'm I'm a journalist, and 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 especially having been at the New York Times for so long, I really, really, really care about getting things right. But sometimes, how do you know? Like, how do you know what you don't even know about this woman? Right. Absolutely. So before I ask you for a teaser for your next season, which we want to know if at all possible, um, what I want to ask you is, I mean, one common theme has been, as you were just talking about, Katie, how hard it is to get material and, you know, how these stories need to come to you. So for our audience members, if they know of a woman or women who they want to, to put into your database, how can they do that? We have a we have a website. It's www.lostwomenofscience.org. And you can go and you can, you, not only can you listen to our podcast and get some more in-depth material about um, the women and the science featured on our podcast, but there is a, a write to us button, contact button, um, where you can let us know um, about the, uh, the women who you feel need that, that attention. And we are always happy to, to, um, to hear about that. We'll respond to you very quickly. We probably get two or three submissions a week and it's always, we enjoy, I think that's one of my favorite things is reading about these women that just come to us. Like we call it over the transom and it's just, it's, it's delightful and like to read about them. And in some ways also frustrating that like, this is how we're finding out about them. Mm -hmm. Right. And it, our email address is lostwomenofscience at gmail.com. Okay. So it's that easy. Audience members, if you know of a woman, send an email and maybe they'll end up on a, on a podcast. Um, okay. And so my last question is, what can we look forward to next? Uh, so 2023 is going to be a great year where we're going to play up three full seasons of um, of uh, multi-episode podcasts. Plus we're introducing our shorts um, or 30, min 30 to 35 minute single episodes on women. So there'll be a lot of great content um, for listeners. Coming soon in early 2023 will be our first few shorts. And then also um, season four of our multi-episode podcast is going to feature a scientist who worked in the field of, of addiction and uh, public health and addiction. And we feel that given everything that's going on in society now and the opioid crisis and a real focus on mental health, um, we feel this is a really timely, important discussion to have. And we are going to feature a really fascinating, extraordinary scientist who did groundbreaking work in this field. 
Okay, terrific. And we'll finally learn the end to Katie's story about her grandma. Yes. So stay tuned. All right. Well, that brings us to the end of our discussion and concludes this session. Thank you, Amy and Katie, for a terrific conversation. Oh, thank you, Juliana. It was great. Thank you so much, Julianne. And thank you also to the Rosalind Franklin Society for hosting this and putting this together. Um, at Lost Women of Science, we, we couldn't be more delighted to have this partnership with the society because Rosalind Franklin just embodies so much of what we care about and what our mission is. So thank you so much. Okay, thank you. And to learn more about the initiative, please, as Amy said earlier, visit their website at https lostwomenofscience.org. Thank you all for joining us today and please stay tuned for our next session.